This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a 1,000 tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and L.A. bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept the job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrobes. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use. Their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid-state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at DigitalOcean.com. If you use the code RubyRogues, you'll get a $10 credit. Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 227 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Saranya Bark. Hey, everybody. I'm Charles Max Wood from Rails Remote Comp. Go check that out, RailsRemoteComp.com. We also have a special guest this week, and that is Daniel Kehoe. Hey, and this is Daniel. I'm checking in from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and it's about midnight right now here in KL. Wow. Wow. You want to talk briefly about uh, kind of your digital nomad lifestyle before we get into some of the other things we're going to talk about? Yeah, I wrote a blog post about it recently on the Rails Apps blog. Um, I titled the blog, um, I Left My Heart in San Francisco, and working on the open source project is my full-time gig, working on Rails apps. And I came to a point at the end of last year, 2014, where I had to make a decision. Either I went out and got a full-time job working for somebody else to pay the rents in San Francisco with the rising cost of living, or I started traveling looking for um, a cheaper place to live and keep the open source project going. So it was um, something of a dilemma to face. I love San Francisco, but I've been traveling since the end of December 2014. I've spent three months in Cape Town, South Africa. Awesome place. I spent two months in Indonesia, both in Bandung and in Bali. I've spent a month in the Philippines in Manila. Um, and I'm currently in Malaysia. I've been here for almost two months. So the project is find the best place in the world where I can live and work on my open source project. And um, it's been an adventure. How do you pick the places you go? Oh, it's kind of, um, well, it's going to be my pick, for actually, uh, at the end of the show, which is nomadlist.io. But um, in addition to that, which is a great listing of all the places that you might find digital nomads, places where people might go, where they're finding communities of, of people working remotely. Um, it's um, just word of mouth with um, colleagues and friends and my own curiosity that drove me to South Africa and the fact that there was a strong, vibrant Ruby Rails community there and people who asked me to come and uh, teach because I do uh, weekend workshops introducing um, Ruby on Rails to beginners. So, yeah, it's been um, kind of hit or miss looking for places where cost of living is low, but um, the amenities are good. Internet is fast. And uh, I haven't found any place quite as much as I like San Francisco, but I'm still looking. Thailand, Chiang Mai may be next on the list. Nha Trang and Da Lat in Vietnam um, are on my list to check out. And um, I'm open to suggestions from any listeners who have suggestions about where is a great place to live and work as a digital nomad. I'd love to hear it. Daniel Kehoe. So yeah, is- I was just going to say it reminds me of something that Alondo Brewington on the iFreak show pointed out. Um, he actually applied. I don't remember if he got in or not. It sounded like he did, but it's a remote year and they travel to a different country every month. And so they're, you know, South America, the first four months, Europe, the next four months, and then Asia, the next four months. And yeah, one of the cities on there is Kuala Lumpur, 
But yeah, they also go to Uruguay, Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, Turkey, Czech Republic, Serbia, Croatia, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So, Wow. If I weren't married and would have to take, what, six other people with me, I would be <laughs> severely tempted to do this. So. It's an emerging option. I think people are beginning to realize that it's possible to make a life, not necessarily tied to one place geographically or, or having some flexibility in your life. And the most interesting thing to me is to discover the picture for me of the digital nomad was always something of a stereotype. It was always probably typically a guy on a beach in Thailand with a laptop and maybe working remotely doing contract work or something like that and living kind of a backpacker, youth hostel kind of life. And I've actually found uh, some of my colleagues who are in midlife, I guess, and couples and even families who uh, have taken up this digital nomad lifestyle. So um, it's definitely uh, an option and it is a remarkable way to live. I think the temptation for me would be to like during the summer when my kids are out of school, I like having mm. some stability when they're in school, but you know, June, July, August, you know, just go. Why and, not? Yeah. Go work yeah. and live in some other country. Is this a permanent lifestyle change for you or is this something you're going to do for, you know, maybe another year, but then you'll come back home to San Francisco? If I come back to San Francisco, I don't think I can work on the open source project. San Francisco has just gotten so expensive, and this is a real disappointment for me because I love the Bay Area. But um, um, I was able to work on this open source project because I had cheap rent out in the Sunset District, and that living situation uh, ended, and I faced the prospect of having to compete with people for very few vacancies and paying you know, upwards of... $2,000, $3,000 a month for a small apartment. And my income is completely from people who support the open source project, who read the Rails apps tutorials, the Capstone Rails tutorials, and my book for beginners, Learn Ruby on Rails. Um, there's no corporate sponsorship for the project I work on, and it's my full-time gig. I don't do consulting. So I have to keep my expenses low. And sad to say, it wasn't really possible in San Francisco anymore. And in fact, it didn't make sense to stay in the U.S. Uh, it made sense to look elsewhere. So I'm on the road until I find a better place uh, to settle permanently. I'm wondering how your friends, family, community reacted to that. Were they supportive? Were they like, what do you think you're doing? You, you have to be here. What was that reaction like? Well, it's definitely disruptive, but I actually think I've got more friends now since I've been traveling than I had in San Francisco. In San Francisco, it was um, easy to get together in person, but it's still, uh, everybody's schedule was so busy. Yeah, it wasn't always easy to uh, get together with people in person. But um, since I've been in different cities, making connections with um, new people, I'm, it's the social media thing has widened my circle of friends because I'm using WhatsApp and WeChat and constantly messaging people, uh, friends in Beijing, friends in South Africa, friends in Indonesia, all new friends. And uh, I don't feel lonely. I feel very, very connected with lots of people around the world. I have a son who's in college in Boston, so I stay in touch with him, of course. And yeah, there's always Facebook for my friends back home in San Francisco. So I think we could talk about this for <laughs> the whole time, but uh, I want to get into what the actual project is. So can you give us a brief overview of what Rails Apps is? I started Rails Apps about oh, four or five years ago. I was doing um, uh, management level consulting work and I'd go off on an assignment with a client and then I'd come back and I'd want to work on my own uh, Rails projects. And this was around 2006 uh, 2008. And um, Rails, of course, changes so fast every six months or so at least, and I'd be catching up. So I started writing, um, putting together basic Rails apps, and then I was writing tutorials to go along with them. I used to be um, a tech journalist. I wrote for PC World magazine years ago, back when it was printed on paper and was as thick as a telephone book with ads for graphic cards and things like that. So tech writing is a first love of mine. And uh, the tutorials were really popular Around um, the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, um, I was looking for a way to do uh, the tutorials and the example applications full time as an open source project. And I was sort of confounded by uh, the challenge of uh, how do you work on open source full time uh, without a job, without a subsidy from um, corporate sponsor or uh, without doing consulting on the side? 
And uh, because I really believe, you know, so many open source projects are jeopardized by um, the three babies, burnout and budget cuts. Um, when people work on open source in their spare time, it's often hard for the project to be sustained. So I was wanting to experiment and find ways to support an open source project. And the thing that I stumbled upon was that people don't like to pay for open source, even contributions, I think because people kind of view um, most software projects as, um, well, I could write it myself if I only had time, so why should I pay for it? But, um, but of course, we still all use it and we still want to use it. But people will pay for documentation. People somehow value the documentation that goes along with the software project. And I was able to develop a subscription model where I was writing tutorials for the example applications that I was putting together. And people were willing to pay uh, $19 a month, um, which was very gratifying. Um, it was enough uh, for me to uh, make a full-time commitment to the project. And the project is... Uh, at the core, uh, example applications. There are um, a dozen uh, starter applications that you might use for any Rails project that you're starting on, uh, typically uh, front-end framework like Bootstrap or Foundation, plus authentication with Devise or OmniAuth, some sort of form of authorization, either using uh, Gem like Pundit or simple role-based authorization, and then um, advanced features like um, Stripe if you're um, going to do payments on the web. So these example applications, are they save time and they avoid the duplication of effort of every developer who wants to fire up a new project, spending um, you know, an hour or two putting together uh, the basic set of gems they always want to use. And it becomes a reference implementation so that um, if Rails has changed since the last time uh, you started a new project and you're not quite sure what the current best practice is or how your favorite gems are currently uh, integrated, um, you can go to the Rails apps GitHub uh, account and, and find a, a repo that's got um, a working, functioning, up-to-date, maintained example application that shows how to put together, for example, bootstrap with the right flash messages, devise with extra features like maybe the name for a user as well as an email, options to use Haml instead of ERB, the current configuration of RSpec so that you don't have to scratch your head trying to remember what the current configuration file should be for RSpec. And it's it's become quite popular. I've found I've been surprised at how many people I'll run into at a conference and saying, oh yeah, Rails Composer, I use that all the time whenever I need to start up a project so yeah somebody yeah, should make a video yeah, about um, it there, unfortunately I, I recently <laughs> heard of an excellent video it's from rails clips i got that right yeah that guy <laughs> okay okay i'm that guy but yeah <laughs> and uh, i'm glad you did that chuck because you know i've been thinking for a long time oh yeah i really should make a video people are always asking me what are the options and what are the choices when you uh when you fire up rails composer and and what are the options and why should i use it and hey you did the work and i've got a link right on the readme page for rails composer you know there's a really nice introduction now um, video introduction courtesy I really like with what you're doing a couple of things. One is, is that I think there are a lot of tutorials out there that are just, okay, we're going to get started with a toy app and we're going to add toy feature to toy app. And, you know, people I think lose interest in a lot of cases because it's not anything that they're ever going to use or show off to anybody. And so if you have something to walk through that says you're going to have something that looks like this at the end and the Rails apps examples are things that people are going to actually want in some cases, you know, so, you know, they want a subscription site or they want, I don't remember what they all are, but they're all things that people are going to at least at some basic level want, even if it's not exactly what they want, um, they can build it out and then they can tweak it to be what they want. So first off, I just wanted to point that out. I mean, the tutorials are, are well explained and, you know, they're applications that are, in my opinion, better than toy apps because they're actually useful. Because they tie together, the whole project ties together. There's the example applications, which serve as reference implementations of basic integrations of uh, authentication, authorization, front-end frameworks, testing. And there is Rails Composer, which can generate um, any of those example applications. Tell everybody, because sometimes people um, get confused. Uh, Rails Composer is free to use. It's open source. Uh, the example applications all live on GitHub repos. They're free to use. 
And um, the only aspect of the project that could cost any money and it's completely voluntary is um, if you want to purchase the tutorials. So when you purchase the tutorials, every line of code in all those example applications generated by Rails Composer is explained in the, t in the dozen tutorials. So the dozen tutorials, when somebody purchases those tutorials, it supports the project. That's the interesting model for this open source project is buy the tutorial and support the open source project. And um, yeah, saves time, uh, reduces cognitive load. Um, I really like to think of it as that concept is there is nothing that Rails Composer does or the example applications do that's particularly hard. It's all the common easy stuff that we do in the first hour or two of building a Rails application. But why spend that first hour or two building the same thing that not only you've built, um, you know, maybe half a dozen times before, but every other developer has built before. So just eliminates that cognitive load of, oh, yeah, you know, how is it that I integrate Bootstrap? How is it that I, you know, set up Devise and RSpec together? Um, it just eliminates that so you can focus immediately on the value add application, focus immediately on what are the features that make your um, minimal viable product. That, I think, is why uh, Rails Composer has been so popular. So how do you decide which examples to build out for Rails apps? I started building from the most basic, and I have continued to add complexity. So um, I look at the kind of applications I would be building for a typical project, and it kind of makes sense that there's a priority of, uh, com of simple to complex. The simplest seem to be um, just basic integration of a front-end framework like Bootstrap or Foundation, and then adding in device, and then uh, another level of complexity. Typically, you're going to want to have some sort of authorization so you can separate admin features, admin pages from user-facing pages or maybe different kinds of users, different user personas. So the applications have kind of built one on uh, another uh, in, in complexity, um, with the most complex ones so far being ones that integrate Stripe for payment. And I'm open to hearing from anybody, what, what are the applications that I've missed? What, what is a generic application on something like maybe social network or adding comments to a blog or something like that might be something to tackle next. Yeah, I've built my fair share of social networks, <laughs> but there are definitely, I think, different classes of applications that people build. And even if you haven't built a tutorial around that class or type of application, in a lot of cases, you are covering, like you said before, all of the different parts that have to work together to make it work. So you've got your authentication, you've got Stripe, you've got roles, you've got, you know, maybe bootstrap or foundation. You know, and, and all of these things, yeah, hooking them up is just something that, that takes time. It doesn't take a lot of mental work. So, yeah, Rails Composer is nice just to pull those in and have them all hooked up to start with. The feature that I'm adding next to Rails Composer is actually what I'm running a Kickstarter campaign to add. Um, I think it's going to be really popular. When Rails Composer generates a basic starter application right now, it's just got a simple home page. Um, it's just got a navigation bar, lets you sign in, sign out with device. That's about all that's there. And I found that I was doing a lot of work to download some bootstrap theme and then try to integrate that, um, within the starter application that I built. And I scratched my head and was like, wait a second, Rails Composer should be doing this. So I'm running a Kickstarter campaign right now, and I think I've got 15 days. Well, I don't know when this is or the podcast goes out, but it's going to be running until October 6th. So if anybody wants to help out, help the open source campaign and open source project with the Kickstarter campaign, you've got until October 6th to check it out. And it's going to be adding um, over 20 bootstrap layouts to Rails Composer. So that when you generate a starter application, you've got your pick of like a, a blog oriented homepage or you've got a um, sort of small business oriented homepage or you've got like a gallery homepage that might be useful for like photographer or, or a catalog. And it's all the kinds of bootstrap themes that you might be searching for on the web. They're all coming from a project called Start Bootstrap, startbootstrap.com, which some people may be familiar with. 
Um, it's a design house that's been producing these free bootstrap themes and they're, they're great. And I often turn to them. Now I'm just going to incorporate them in uh, Rails Composer. Um, it looks like um, we're going to meet the funding goals with the Kickstarter campaign. And I've got a little ways to go. So I hope people will uh, check out the Kickstarter campaign. There's a video that explains Rails Composer and the features that were going to be added. And the best part of the Kickstarter campaign is that since Kickstarter is kind of a give something, get something kind of deal, that I'm offering uh, all the tutorials that I've written, plus great uh, learning resources for Rails from other people, uh, including Rails Clips from Charles Max Wood. There's a one month free membership of that. Two months, two months free. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm happy to support projects like this and. The thing is, is that, I mean, if I give away two months of uh, Rails clips, I mean, sure, that does cost me money, you know, if they're people that would have subscribed anyway, but it's not something that I'm going to necessarily miss, and it's a great way to support projects like this. So, you know, and I, I'm sure that the other contributors, uh, you know, Go Rails and Learneru and all these other guys, you know, it's the same thing, you know, it's like, hey, we're happy to contribute to the project, we're happy to help, you know, raise awareness of it, and it's a great resource, I mean... Uh, I think a lot of people benefit from having something like Rails Composer in the community where maybe it saves you a half hour, maybe it saves you an hour, but it's still something that for me is something that I don't necessarily want to do myself just because it's not something that's really that interesting. It's an awesome community. I was particularly gratified um, two or three days ago. Um, Michael Hartle, who's, of course, got the Rails tutorial book and organization that's very, very well known as a as a book that's recommended for learning Rails, uh, actually did me a huge favor. And he's got a new book coming out on um, it's called um, Learn Enough of the Command Line to be Dangerous. Um, it's a new series that he's producing. And he um, he did a posting uh, on his blog about his new book. And as a PS, he mentioned, he said, go check out Daniel check out the advanced tutorials that he's made available. And it was like super gratifying for me to have somebody like Michael Hartle um, make a recommendation of um, my tutorials because people look at his book and my book, Learn Ruby on Rails, which is on Amazon. And they're like, oh, those guys must be competing, you know, two different authors writing books for, you know, to, to learn Rails. And, you know, in fact, we're really um, supportive of different approaches and all serving particularly the needs of people who are getting into into Rails for the first time. People are always asking me what, you know, what's the difference between Michael's book and Hartle's book and, and your book, Daniel. So that's great. Mm hmm. Yeah, to see that collaboration is awesome. So one thing I'm thinking about is Rails Composer for an experienced developer, you know, as Chuck said, doing things that, you know, you don't really want to do, you're not excited about doing, but you have to do. So Rails Composer seems like such a great tool for that. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how it fits into the learning process for a more beginner person, right? Someone who's really new to Rails, someone who maybe doesn't fully understand how things work. Is Rails Composer, is it better to use something like that once you have an understanding and it's more of a shortcut to do the things that you know how to do, but you don't want to do? Or do you see it as a good introduction to the Rails system for someone who's a beginner? Oh, if I'm right, you were, you were at Flatiron School. I, the, um, yes, I was. I knew that. And it's interesting <laughs> because I've had this discussion with uh, Avi, Avi Flambaum, who runs Flatiron School, mm -hmm. who is somebody I totally admire as somebody who's a, a teacher in the community. And he's been really supportive of tutorials I've, I've written. And in fact, he's adopted them as a supplementary uh, material for uh, students at Flatiron School. Um, but we've also talked about Rails Composer. And my initial take on Rails Composer was that, oh, my God, don't tell beginners, don't tell students about Rails Composer because they'll just take the <laughs> shortcut and immediately generate this app and not know, you know, anything about Rails and then jump in and uh, attempt to use it. And uh, I think that's the kind of the immediate response of most developers. If they heard about Rails Composer and how quickly it can generate a Rails application, um, that would be dangerous to um, let a, a Rails learner know about this. But I, I, I've recently actually, people have shared a different perspective for me, which is that you can use something like Rails Composer to show you how it should be done. And that's where the tutorials fit in because the tutorials actually explain uh, every line of code uh, that's in the applications generated by Rails Composer. So if you're a beginner and 
I think, yes, you should at least have dived a little ways into learning Rails before you attempt to use Rails Composer. But it's not the end of the world if you get to the point where you're totally frustrated trying to build your first application. Um, you're spending, you know, an hour or more spinning your wheels on something, trying to figure it out. And then you just want to see a reference implementation about, like, show me code that works. Show me code that is known to work that I can actually run and see the feature working. And then let me take it apart. Let me dig into it, investigate, see how it's put together. So I've got a good working example of something that I'm looking at, like authentication with device or authorization uh, with roles, or just something as simple as integrating um, a front-end framework like Bootstrap. I think that's the place it has for a beginner. And I don't think anybody realistically is going to think that they're a Rails developer just because they can fire up this tool and generate an application in a few minutes. But it's a good um, it's a good learning tool, potentially, especially coupled with the tutorials. I love that idea of using it as a reference because, you know, a lot of times even now I'll go back to just older things that I've used as a reference. And so to be able to have, you know, a set number of, of applications that with tutorials that explain exactly what's going on, I think is a is a really fantastic idea. I'm wondering how the tutorials are how they they fit in. So one of the the very common pain points that I've heard in the code newbie community is that people who want to learn to code will do tutorials or read books and the tutorials will give them a very definitive step-by-step breakdown of this is how you, you know, this is the button you push, this is the command you run to do the thing you want to do. And so they end up with an app that works, that's very functional, but they don't necessarily know how it works or what things they could have changed. And they're not able to really understand the nuances of what they just built. I'm wondering how does Rails Composer and your book and tutorials, how do they help people really know what they're doing beyond just ending up with an application they wanted? That's a particular challenge. Um, it's a challenge for um, most tutorials, um, even most um, coding boot camps. Um, people reach that point that they call um, the junior gap where, yeah, you can follow somebody's recipe, but can you really create something from scratch yourself? Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a particular approach to teaching that uh, makes it easier to overcome that gap. And that's what I try to do in my book, which is um, not just to provide the book that I've written, the Learn Ruby on Rails book, which is on Amazon. You can check it out. I'm, I'm lucky to have a lot of five-star reviews for it. So I think I'm doing the right thing with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's specifically aimed at absolute beginners, unlike Michael Hartle's book, which um, most of us learned Rails from because we already had a background as developers uh, using um, uh, using PHP or um, doing development in Java web applications, um, already programmers. This book, Learn Ruby on Rails, it's got a fluffy cat on the cover just to show people that it's not going to be intimidating. It gives a context and a background, and it gives formulas and strategies for um, learning and solving problems that you won't get in a typical cookie-cutter recipe tutorial. It, I tell people it's really two books in one. It's a step-by-step tutorial, so you can build a real Rails application. But it's also a self-help book because it addresses questions like Ruby uh, Rails challenges. What makes Rails hard to learn? What are the stumbling blocks? Um, what are the challenges that you're going to encounter as a developer? And some of those challenges um, are technology-specific. Yeah, like it's hard to develop uh, and learn uh, Rails uh, if you've got a Windows computer very specific, uh, and some of them more psychological. But what is it when you don't have role models who look like you? That is a particular challenge for people learning programming, and uh, it's far more psychological and sociological than technical. So the book attempts to address a range of issues and provide a range of strategies so that people um, actually feel prepared. And ultimately, you have to do the work. You have to start building applications. Uh, you have to build a number of applications and you have to struggle through them. And it's the resources you have as you struggle through your, your building your applications that determine how quickly uh, you're going to become a skilled developer. At least that's what I believe and what I've seen in my teaching. So one thing I want to jump back to real quick was the question about Rails Composer for newbies. I did find that uh, when I was setting it up, 
that when I ran through all the options at the end, it didn't explain to me very well where to go to set all the configuration options. I mean, I knew kind of uh-huh. where to go because I was experienced, so I just went and did it. But uh, yeah. I, I could see that as something they run into. But the flip side is, is that a lot of times, you know, the newbies don't want to, and, and I'm kind of the same way to a certain degree, I don't want to struggle through, how do I set all this crap up? You know, I want to build something interesting. And so I do like that it does provide that shortcut. And then they can go back and figure out how those pieces work later if they can get the configuration working. There's two main options for Rails Composer. And I think in your in your, in your your video introduction, you went through the, uh, yes. the custom application approach, which is what most of the experienced developers are using. Um, a friend of mine who's a consultant and also a digital nomad, he's, he left uh, South Africa with his wife and he's now traveling. I think you're in the Philippines right now. And um, we were in the same hotel uh, a few weeks ago and he was saying, hey, Daniel, that R- Rails Composer, yeah. That's a great tool. He said, it's been, it's been a couple of months since I last had to build a Rails application, so uh, I thought I'd check out that thing that you do. So like, okay, cool. He said, yeah, so I fired that thing up, Rails Composer. Yeah, I was able to uh, zoom through. I was able to pick, uh, you know, Hamel instead of ERB. I picked RSpec, uh, installed Simple Form. Uh, yeah, I decided to disable Turbo Links for that project because I hate Turbo Links because of the mess it makes with my JavaScript. Uh, and he was like, yeah, cool. I said, uh, okay. Did you build one of the uh, Rails apps example applications, the ones that are built into Rails Compose? You said, no, 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 I just went that custom route and I picked all those options. So most experienced developers tend to just uh, go through that list of customers because they know what the options are. They know the difference mm-hmm. between Hamel, ERB, and Slim. They know the difference between picking device versus OmniAuth. Um, they know the difference between implementing uh, role, simple role-based authorization or pundit. But a beginner will just look at that list of options and be completely confounded and hopefully uh, start Googling what all those things are and learn what all, are, what all the basic gems are that most developers use. But there is another choice for that newbie and also for the developer who is uh, comfortable with uh, the set menu which is um, you can build any of the example applications that are in the Rails apps repo, the ones that have the tutorials that go along with them. That's uh, uh, an option in Rails Composer. There's a dozen of the uh, Rails apps, starter apps, the pre-built ones that match the ones in the repos exactly. So for a beginner who, who isn't sure whether they should pick ERB or Hamel, uh, it makes those choices for them, and then they can refer to the tutorials That is, if they choose to support the project by purchasing the tutorials, I want to imply that the tutorials are free for everybody because they're not. That's what supports the project. But all the code is explained in the tutorials if they pick one of the basic starter applications. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, you were the guy who went the hard route and picked the custom applications. (laughs) I always do things the hard way. All righty. Well, I know that we're uh, up against some... uh hard timeline so i'm gonna go ahead and push us into the picks before we get to picks i want to take some time to thank our silver sponsor this episode is sponsored by code school code school is an online learning destination for existing and aspiring developers that teach us through entertaining content they provide immersive video lessons with in-browser challenges which means that each course has a unique theme and storyline and feels much more like a game whether you've been programming for a long time or have only just begun code school has something for everyone You can master Ruby on Rails or JavaScript, as well as Git, HTML, CSS, and iOS. And more than a million people around the world use CodeSchool to improve their development skills by learning or doing. You can find more information at CodeSchool.com slash RubyRogues. Saran, what are your picks? Sure. Uh, So, Daniel, I think we we were kind of thinking of the same thing in our pick section, because I was going to do the the Nomad thing as well. Um, No kidding. The one... Yeah, the whole like nomad concept. I really like that. So one that I'm gonna do. Hopefully you're not doing this one. Is remoteok.io. Was that one of yours? Oh no, I haven't heard of that. I gotta check that out. Thank you. Awesome. No problem. So it's a job board that lets you find a job that you can do anywhere. Um, and it's not just for developers. It has everything from design to. I think it's mostly like tech focused, but there's also other things. There's like code instructors and QA and all kinds of things. But it's remote jobs. Uh, it tells you, you know, how long it's been there for, what types of skills you need, and it's it looks really really neat. And I feel like it's such a great tool for people who are interested in working remotely. So that was my pick. 
All right. I've got a couple of picks here. First off, I just want to remind everybody we are doing Rails Remote Conf. The website's up. You can go submit calls for proposals. You can also go and buy your tickets. The early bird tickets, I think I have them set to end on October 5th. I think I'm going to extend that to October 10th. So don't miss out on that because the prices do go up. The other pick that I have is uh, there's a website. I think it's weworkremotely.com. Anyway, it's done by the guys that do uh, Basecamp, and these are all remote jobs. And they've got a whole bunch of Ruby. I think I see some other stuff like Android and front end. But anyway, so you can go check that out as well, weworkremotely.com, um, again, for that digital nomad thing. And yeah, I, I definitely enjoy working remotely. The things that make it easier for me are Slack and Screen Hero. So I'll pick those as well, and we'll put links to those in the show notes. Daniel, what are your picks? Something Pine Grove Web Editor which I just ran across, and it kind of opened my eyes to something that I used to like years ago. Back in the day, we used things like maybe Dreamweaver, or I think there was something called Coda on the Mac, which were, you know, graphical HTML editors. And they, they all, you know, had some real big limitations. It always felt like I was hitting a brick wall with them. And eventually I gave it up and went back to HTML and CSS by hand and TextMate or Sublime. But I ran into this thing called Pine Grove Web Editor, and um, I really am liking it because I get so frustrated with trying to set up like um, bootstrap grids and boxes and rows and how many um, tags. I mean, we're talking Ruby. This is pretty basic stuff, HTML stuff. But this is a, a graphical web editor, you know, for the 21st century. Uh, actually, it does a whole bunch of stuff uh, manipulating the DOM, so it actually uh, generates live previews as you make any kind of changes, bootstrap layouts, um, all that. Pine Grove, web editor, check it out. My second pick, and I mentioned it earlier, is nomadlist.io, which is a website. It's destinations, and it provides ratings and info. I'm looking at it right now. You can go to Chiang Mai in Thailand, Phuket in Thailand. You can go to past Thessaloniki, uh, Portland, Oregon, Jeju, Jeju Island in South Korea. And it tells you the air quality, the weather, whether there's co-working spaces, um, whether it's LGBT friendly country, whether it's um, comfortable for women to be um, visiting and traveling in the country, how fast the Wi-Fi is. So data isn't always accurate, but e even if your travel is only fantasy travel, it's pretty cool to look at nomadlist.io and think about the places you could go. And finally, if you do get to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, KL as the locals say, mostly because I think Kuala Lumpur is a tongue twister, you got to check out Lo Yat Plaza. Oh my God, you can geek out. Uh, if you've been to the Bay Area, the old fries, those giant supermarkets of computer parts, Low Yacht Plaza puts fries to shame. It's like an order of magnitude of geeky gadgets oh, beyond. Wow. It's uh, it's this shopping mall, and there's nothing in this six-floor shopping mall but stalls upon stalls upon stores upon stores featuring really bargain-priced geekiness. So you can get like, um, you know, the kind of um, adapter cable that you might have to go to the Apple store and pay $25 for. Uh, here it's like $4 or $5 at Low Yacht Plaza. And it's like totally a place to totally geek out. So in the, oh, and you can buy Apple products. Like I bought uh, a new MacBook Air for at least 20% less than it would cost in the United States because of not just the exchange rate, but the pricing here in Malaysia is um, is less for uh, Apple products than uh, just about anywhere else in the world for some reasons I don't really know. But yeah, check out Loyat Plaza in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Yeah, whenever I go down to Las Vegas, I usually wind up there once or twice a year. All right. Well, thank you, Daniel, for coming. And thanks for all the work that you put in for the community. I think people... Uh, really appreciate it. And if you don't, then go check it out because uh, it is really, it's really handy to be able to go and actually see a working application. And uh, Rails Composer, in my opinion, is just awesome. So, Oh, let me plug that Kickstarter campaign again, because if anyone's listening to this and it's, it's not October 6th yet, please go check out the Kickstarter campaign for Rails Composer and help me take it to the next level. Thank you so much. Even if he's exceeded the goal, I can tell you, having run my own Kickstarter campaign, that every little bit of extra helps. 
So um, make sure that you, if you um, have used Rails Composer and you just want to throw a few dollars at it, awesome. If you want to go and actually, you know, back it and get access to the tutorials and things like that that are being offered, then do that too. You know, because uh, a lot of times this work is kind of thankless and this is our way of saying, hey, we want more of what you're doing. Um, we appreciate the work you're doing. So yeah, go go chip in. Yeah, thank you very much. The appreciation is really what drives um it was what drives my fuels the project and keeps me going. And when I hear back from people that they're using the tools, it's like, yeah, that's what I want to be doing. It's really uplifting. All right. Well thanks again for coming. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C A C H E F L Y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join a conversation with the rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash parlay.